it is our conviction that the life of Jesus Christ pointed us in the direction of Muhammad The message of Jesus Christ pointed us towards the Quran. The life of Jesus Christ pointed us towards Islam. And this is why we want to say to you and say to the world that whoever is a lover of Jesus Christ, at least they deserve, they owe it to themselves, at least look into the life of Muhammad. Go to the encyclopedia, go to the computer and punch in the name Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. Peace and blessing be upon him. If you dare, just punch it in and see what those who are not Muslim said about Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. Well, I'll tell you, the five foremost premier biographers of this age, not a previous age, this age, the 21st century, the five premier biographers of this age, authorities said, when they examined and they put forward the proposition, who are the 100 great, greatest human beings that impacted humanity throughout the history? That means selecting 100 human beings who impacted the most profound upon humanity. What do you think they found? Or whom do you think they selected? Now these five biographers, they were not Muslims. But three of them conclusively said, it has to be Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. Michael H. Hart is one of them. He has a book called The 100 Greatest Human Beings. And his selection was whom? Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. And he admitted, I tried very hard because of being a Christian, I tried very hard to put Jesus there. But when I looked at the criteria categorically, Jesus was not a father. Jesus was not a husband. Jesus was not a ruler. Jesus Christ was not a statesman. And his message was not memorized in his own life. Therefore, his religion never came to be a government. So looking at the criteria, he said, the only one I could select was Muhammad wasallam, And so he did. I say to you, go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, go to the computer, read the book of Michael J. Hart, read the works and the sayings of many non-Muslims before you hear it from a Muslim. You owe it to yourself to look into the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Almighty God said about him, وَمَا أَرْسَرْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالَمِينَ O Muhammad, you are sent to the whole world as a mercy. No other prophet was sent to the whole world, they were sent to their own people. I say to you, brothers and sisters, and our guests, you, you owe it to yourself. Punch in the name Quran, Q-U-R-A-N, punch it in, and see if you can compare, see if you can find a scripture, see if you can find a writing, see if you can find a document that compares with the Quran. You will not. Even the Bible, the gospel that Jesus Christ recited, he didn't have it underneath his arms. He wasn't walking around with a book. And nobody memorized what he brought and when he left. There were pieces of it, different people had. But the Quran was revealed in the life of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, over 23 years. And guess what? While he was living, he transferred it in its entirety to his followers. And they transferred it to their children and other generations so that here in this room and in every other gathering of Muslims, there's at least one or two or three or four, maybe 10 people who have memorized the 6,626 verses of the Quran in its entirety. It has been preserved since that time. I ask you, if all the Bibles in the world, all the Bibles in the world were thrown in the ocean, who would produce the Bible again? Nobody could, because they don't even agree about what the Bible is now. But if all the Qur'ans were thrown into the ocean right now, all of them, we could produce the Qur'an all over again. We could bring a Chinese, 
Hafiz, memorizer of the Quran, a Russian memorizer of the Quran, an American memorizer of the Quran, a German memorizer of the Quran, who didn't even know each other. They would all come here together, and in two days, they could all recite simultaneously, and the Quran is back again. You owe it to yourself to read this powerful scripture. Don't ignore it. You cannot afford to ignore it. Either it's profound, either it's from God, either it is comprehensive, either it is as I say it is, or it is not. At least you should investigate it. Why should you be blind to something that might have that kind of impact on your life and the life of others? After all, this is not the legislation of Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. It is the legislation of whom? Almighty God. Dear brothers and sisters, finally, I suppose I told you that this book had been universally preserved without the slightest alteration of any kind in 15 centuries. If all of this is true, what I'm, uh, 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 if all of this is true, what I'm saying, you have to agree that this book is quite profound and unique to say the least. You would be honest if you were to say that that it has to be a very profound book. Many other non-Muslims came to that conclusion, although they didn't follow it and they didn't benefit from it. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Napoleon Bonaparte, Bonaparte, Winston Churchill, many of them, and even Bill Clinton. He said the Quran is a great book, but obviously he didn't benefit from the morals of it. Now, brothers and sisters, you know, after you leave here tonight, you're going somewhere. I mean, tonight, you're going somewhere after here. And after you live the decreed life that has been laid out and mandated for you, you are also going somewhere after here, after here after because after all it's about after here after <laughs> you say when we say now it is what then there is no present there's no such thing as the moment it's gone And you need to think about this drama and this issue carefully. Because when death comes, it doesn't send a postcard. <laughs> when you get the warrant from God, it's called death. And it comes quickly and swiftly. And you're going to answer for the gift that you have been given. And this is what we're all talking about. The gift that you have been given. This life that you have been given. It's a responsibility. Now, if you came here and you didn't know, well, you know now. You see? You know now. If you didn't know before, now you know. So that means now you are responsible. You can't lie. Our job was simply to put the proposition in front of you. And to be Muslim, it doesn't mean you have to come somewhere where the Muslims gather and dive in a pool. You don't have to go and buy some material and wrap your head in a bandana. If you're a woman, you don't have to go someplace and buy some black clothing. Although there is some significance to the way the Muslim women dress, and there's a significance to men who choose to wrap their heads. And yes, we do wash before our prayers, but it's not the rituals 
This is not the issue. Everything starts with a declaration. If you came to this country from another country to become a citizen, what did you have to do? Did you have to make a declaration? Yes. When you get off the plane coming from one country to another, what do you have to do? You have to make a declaration. Before you get your PhD, you have to do what? Write a thesis. Everything in this world that allows a person to graduate or to pass on and to be accepted calls for what? A declaration. So I'm asking you, as a human being, I'm not trying to convert anybody. I'm not asking you to do anything that you wouldn't do anyway. But I'm proposing to you, as a human being, that you say inside of yourself that there's none to be worshipped, none to be acknowledged, except the creator of the heavens and the earth. I'm asking you to say that. Inside yourself first. Just like saying your own name inside yourself. The difference between making that declaration and saying your name, you've been accustomed to saying that all your life. So if I said, excuse me, what's your name? Huh? Pam. Pam. See? If she didn't tell me her name and I just happened to know it and I said, Pam, she would look directly at me and stand up. Because that's the psychological reaction. When you hear your name, what do you do? You respond. Well, inside of you, there is a natural reaction towards God. Unless that natural reaction has been covered or disfigured. Then when God calls you, you don't act and you don't respond. And that's tragedy. I am proposing to you who are non-Muslims to declare that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God. You can determine for yourself later on if you want to be a Muslim, formally, if you want to accept that Muhammad is the messenger of God, formally, you can determine that for yourself, but minimally. Raise your hands if you accept that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God. Muslims, put your hands down. <laughs> Those who are non-Muslims, I asked you for the proposition to bear witness that there's none to be worshipped except the Creator, to acknowledge that there's only one Creator, that is your Lord and my Lord. I ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Brothers and sisters, those people who were courageous enough to listen through all of this and also to acknowledge the basic proposition that there's none to be worshipped except the Creator, you should understand that there are pillars to every building, a foundation to every building, and that Islam also have its pillars and its foundation. You can be provided with all the information that you need, free of charge. You can get a copy of this lecture, free of charge. Those who have the courage inside of themselves to proclaim that there's nothing to be worshipped except the Almighty. You can get a copy of this lecture, free of charge, to examine it further. Secondly, you can receive information, literature, free of charge, from the many Islamic organizations, bookstores here in Sydney. You can get one of my cards, contact me by the email, and we'll send to you free of charge an illustrated guide on Islam. We'll send that to you free of charge. You can visit one of the many Islamic centers in Sydney, and I promise you, you will not be taken hostage. <laughs> I advise that you sit down with a Muslim and let them explain a little further to you the prescription of Islam. Take the next step, that is wash your hands 
like Jesus did. Wash your feet like Jesus did. And stand before the altar of God. Not a wooden altar. The altar of God is wherever you are. Remove all the images and all your preconditioning after washing yourselves as has been prescribed. And then learn how to worship as Jesus Christ worshiped, as all the prophets worshiped. Because this, again, we're coming back to the origin of our statement. What have we been created for? What is the purpose of life? To do what? To acknowledge Almighty God and to worship Almighty God and to obey Almighty God. I want to thank you. I want to thank Almighty God. And I ask him to guide us and to help us and to appreciate the honor of being able to make this presentation to, to, to you tonight. I want to thank the organizers of this gathering. I want to thank all the people that wasn't able to sit down here tonight. Uh, I, really feel, I really feel a bit disappointed that three or four hundred people came and they couldn't come in because of the restrictions of the hall, but we had no way of knowing. Honestly, I'll be very frank with you. I don't anticipate 5, 10, 15, 20, or 50 people. I don't know. I leave it up to the organizers. I lecture all over the world. I've been to 37 countries in the last five, six, or seven years. And sometimes I lecture to 15 people, 20 people, sometimes 1,000 people. And I'm not, I don't have any particular credentials for what I do. It's a mandate from God to share whatever it is that I do. I'm a new Muslim. I didn't say I was a young Muslim. I'm a new Muslim, meaning that Islam was new to me when I accepted it. My father and my mother and my grandparents, they were not Muslims. I was born into Christianity. And in many ways, I still feel obligated. And maybe I'm suited and maybe I can say that I compete with the Christians in my love and attachment to Jesus Christ and his message. But God guides whom he pleases. And I am grateful that God guided me to Islam. And all praise is due to creator who guides whom he wills and who guided me to Islam. And without his guidance, I could never have been guided. I want to thank you, the Muslims, I want to thank you also for your support and any non-Muslims that you brought here. And certainly, any non-Muslim that you brought here tonight will be for you as an ajra. And the non-Muslims that came here, honestly, your presence here is more sacred and more important than all the Muslims combined. Because the Muslims already have the treasure. They didn't have to come. You came by your inquisitiveness. You came out of your respect. You came because you wanted to hear, you wanted to know. At least minimally, I asked the non-Muslims, when you leave from here, if you don't accept Islam, if you don't embrace Islam, if you never give the consideration to it, one thing that you would be able to do, that when somebody says that Muslims worship Muhammad, what will you tell them? That's not true. Muslims do not worship Muhammad. Muhammad was just a man and just a prophet. When they say to you that Islam is a fanatic religion, that Muslims hate Christians, what will you tell them? That's not true. And you will tell them that if some Muslims committed some crimes, if that is the case, you should not indict a global faith because of the action of a few people just as we would not indict Jesus Christ for the actions of many so-called Christian nations and organizations for the perpetuation of slavery and war and so many things. But the issue here is not the crimes committed by Christians or the crimes committed by Muslims. The issue is that the message of Jesus Christ is pure, and the message of the Prophet Muhammad and Islam is pure. And anyone who is pure in their hearts, they should be able to understand that. And our proposition to you is that you consider that Islam is a system of life that has the capacity 
to address the issues of the world and to offer some propositions of peace, both in your life and in your family, in your society and the world. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika wa nashadu wa la ilaha ila anta wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ulayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I will only answer questions on the topic. So if you ask me about Osama bin Laden, or September the 11th, or the war in Iraq, I won't answer it because that's not on our topic. The first question, I'm a non-Muslim atheist. But I am starting to find out that there is a God, but too scared to face it or admit it. How do I get stronger? I think that one of the th ways that you can become stronger in your conviction is to read. Because when you read, you don't have to be afraid, because you can read by yourself. And your heart will never lie to you. The heart is an instrument that God gave to the human being, that a person continues to counsel their heart, and they are sincere. That means they don't lie to themselves. Go by yourself, sit by yourself, think, meditate, pray if you can. Or if you don't want to call it pray, reflect. Think about the heavens and earth. Think about your life. Think about your impending death. Think about the source of creation. Think about some of the things that we spoke about tonight. And if you're willing, read the Quran. When you open up the Quran, it's not going to explode in your face. It's not going to cause you to be brainwashed. You're not going to open the Quran and find that some kind of fragrance comes out of it that just makes you intoxicated and forces you to be Muslim. No. Read the Quran. Like millions of other people just like myself did. In America, every year, more than 45,000 people accept Islam every year who used to be Christians or atheists. And last year, since September the 11th, guess what? More than 78,000 people accepted Islam. And I am one of 2.3 million Muslims in America, new Muslims, who used to be Christians or atheists or something. So I say that first of all, May Allah guide you. May Allah strengthen you. May he give you the courage to continue because at least you started your journey by admitting, one, that you might have came here thinking yourself to be an atheist, but you can't call yourself an atheist any longer because an atheist is a person that is convinced that there is no God, no religion. You're not convinced of that. You're already on your way. And we ask Allah to guide you. I don't know who brought you here, who invited you here, but it is their responsibility to provide you with the example and the information to help the seed of faith grow in your life. Um, Aki, would you give the non-Muslims here as many cards as I, these are my cards. Those are my business cards and you will find my email there. You can either write to me or you can send an email to me and I'll see to it that you get any information that you can, that you, uh, that you need, and I will answer you any questions that you may have to the best of my ability. Where Jesus announced the coming of Muhammad, where did Jesus announce the coming of Muhammad? Peace and blessing be upon him. Well, first of all, I do not quote Bible. I say to you that in your scriptures, there is such and such evidence. 
But I don't use the Bible as a proof because I'm not a Bible authority. But I say in your scripture, there is such and such a proof. If you will read carefully in your Bible, you will find that when Jesus Christ was in the upper room in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember that story, don't you? He was with his disciples and they asked him, Oh, Rabbi, what shall happen to us when you leave us? He said, Fear not, for I will send unto you the Comforter, and you will know him because when he comes, he will speak of me. And he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears from God, that shall he speak. And your hearts and your minds are not prepared, but so be it. When he, the comforter, comes, he will make all things plain for you. And what he receives from God, that shall remain with you forever. Now these are four prophecies that Jesus made to his disciples. What's the first one? He will speak of me. In the Quran, there's a chapter called Maryam, which means what? Mary. God revealed to Muhammad the Quran and one of the 114 chapters is named after the mother of Jesus Christ. Now is that speaking of Jesus Christ and confirming him? Yes. In that chapter, it speaks about the birth of Mary, it speaks about the birth of Jesus Christ and all of his miracles and his life and his worship and his sacrifice and God said clearly to us, neither was he crucified nor was he killed. Now don't you think that in a book that God revealed to Muhammad وسلم, if he mentioned Jesus mother Mary don't you think that God should have named one of those chapters after Muhammad's mother he didn't because that wasn't necessary it was necessary to name one chapter after Jesus' mother or Jesus because Jesus said what he will mention me he will confirm me the Quran did that second thing he said he will not speak of himself, not words from himself, but whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak. Brother, can you recite the ayah? A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Wa ma yantiqu anil hawa In huwa illa this verse of the Quran says concerning Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, that Muhammad, he does not speak from his own feeling. But whatsoever he hears from Almighty God, from revelation, inspiration, that is what he speaks. Is that what Jesus said? Thirdly, he said, your hearts and your minds are not prepared now, but how be it when he the comforter comes, that counselor comes, he will make all things plain to you. The Quran says, verily this is a book that makes all things plain and clear. Is that what Jesus said? The fourth thing, he says that whatsoever he re receives from God shall remain with you forever. The Quran has been intact as it was revealed for 1424 years since it was revealed. And that's what Jesus Christ said. The Quran states that Allah is forgiving. What is the limit of forgiveness? There is no limit. Almighty God mentioned to us in a hadith al qudsi that his forgiveness is the greatest of all of his attributes. And also, yes, God is loving. Al-Wadud, Al-Wadud, the loving. Yes, God is loving. But he is also Hamim. Tanzeel al-Kitab min Allah al-Aziz al-Alim. غافل الدنب وقابل التوب شديد لقاب التور 
la ilaha illa huwa ilayhi al-masir so almighty god is not just loving and he is not just forgiving but he's also swift in taking account he's also the punisher he's also the one that is able to hold humanity accountable so he's not just a loving god a relenting god a redeeming God, a forgiving God. He's a God that also holds us accountable and will judge us and will hold us responsible for the gift that he has given us. That is also his attribute. Question. It is quite clear that Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him as a person, had a great impact on the world. Do you believe Islam as a religion revolutionized the world? The history is already clear. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was a shepherd who himself was unlettered. He never went to school. He never learned to read. He was never taught to read. He was never educated. Yet this Quran was revealed in 23 years. And after the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, passed away. The whole of Arabia was under Islam, but that's nothing. There were three existing empires at the time, Rome, Persia, Abyssinia. 23 years after the Quran was revealed, Rome, Persia, Abyssinia became part of the Muslim empire. And that is nothing. For 1,000 years, the Islamic empire, the Islamic civilization ruled the whole world. 1,000 years. This came from what? A revelation that a desert Arab received who himself was illiterate, unlearned, in the desert that no one considered even a thought, an idea, a consideration. This itself is a phenomenon that we can only attribute to the profundance of the God's word. Islam still has the resilience and the power to reform the world. Not under the sword, but under the command of Almighty God because Islam, as I mentioned before, is a legislation. And that's why it became and can be a world government. It is not just a book to be read like poetry. It is not just an abstract book to be written for appreciation. It's a law, it's a book of revelation, inspiration, and legislation. Having faults in the past and being a single mother, can I become a good Muslim? Certainly. And how do you start? You start by saying, La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah. This is how you start. You start by taking the first step. Not because Muslims expect you to do it, because I guarantee you this, that if all the non-Muslims in here became Muslims tonight, formally, Khalid will not get $1,000 a head. No benefit will come to me for that except the benefit that God gives for guiding somebody, for opening up the treasure of Islam to somebody, for, sh for being willing to share the information with somebody. That's the reward that we're looking for. The gift is yours. And if you're feeling it, do what you have to do while you're feeling it. Because the way the world is, the world is like a roller coaster. Tomorrow, you may not feel it. Take advantage of the inspiration when it comes to you. Because sometimes in life, the way the world is, inspiration is few and far between. You know that, don't you? That person who wrote that, I hope that you will be one of the people that will meet with me when we leave from this uh, room. If Jesus was not sent to the Samaritans and the Gentiles, bearing in mind that Jesus' message was to prophesy about the Comforter, why was this so? Why wouldn't God want every tribe to know about the coming of the Comforter? 
Well, if you know the nature of scripture, you'll, you'll know that God sent a prophet from among the Bani Israel. All the prophets came from a designated group of people, all the way from Moses, Abraham, all the way up. They came from a designated group of people in the beginning. But every prophet came only to a tribe, only to a specific people. This was God's way, his determination. God guided the world through a tribe, a group of people designated to be prophets. Until finally God sent a person, a prophet, a messenger, from also a tribe, but not to that tribe, but to the whole world. This comforter, Jesus Christ, his specific purpose was to put in check and correct the excesses and the deviations of the banning Israel and then to announce the good news of a comforter. Now why God chose Jesus Christ to speak of that comforter? That's God's business. That is the fact. Such is the words of Jesus Christ that reflects that. And such is the words of Muhammad and the revelation that came to Muhammad Sallallahu that confirms that. What I would invite you to do is to look closely at the life of Jesus Christ, the real documented life of Jesus Christ and the life of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and see how they interlock. Read the message of Jesus Christ, the real gospel of Jesus Christ to the best of your ability. As a matter of fact, I point you to the gospel of St. Barnabas. Now you won't find that in the popular New Testament because that's five books that's called the Apocrypha. Apocrypha means expunged, canceled. Because at the Council of Nicaea in 354 years after Jesus Christ, the Romans at the Council of Nicaea, they decided that there were five books that they didn't want to include in the New Testament. The Gospel of Barnabas, who was the blind companion of Jesus Christ, was not included in the New Testament. But if you go to the Gospel of Barnabas, again, go to your computer and punch in the word Barnabas. And then add to it Saint Barnabas. And you'll find that his genealogy and you'll find that his history and his biography was that he was the blind companion of Jesus Christ. And his book was called the Gospel of Barnabas. There in the Gospel of Barnabas, the name of Jesus Christ, I mean the name of Muhammad is mentioned clearly and perfectly. It says, I am a mother, a non-Muslim. My son is a Muslim. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you also for coming. And I wish that also you would be one of the people that I get a chance to meet. As a new revert from Roman Catholic, I'd like to know if we are children of God. Well, children in the sense that God doesn't really have children. He doesn't beget. That means God doesn't become pregnant, nor does God make anyone pregnant. By his command, women become pregnant. By his command, Mary became pregnant, but God doesn't beget because begetting and being begotten is a human animalistic function. But if we say that God is the father in the sense that God is the owner, that God is the Lord, that God is the sustainer, that God is the creator, and that we are the subordinates. And if we are good servants of God, God loves us, similar to a man or a person loving their children, then in a metaphorical sense, yes, we're all children of God, but not in the physical sense, not in the literal sense. And that's the only sense that Jesus Christ could have meant. As a matter of fact, Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, God said, Isaiah is my son. And he said, Abraham is even my son, and David is my son. So by that mean, God had sons by the tons. But in a metaphorical sense. So didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the light? 
Nobody goes to the Father but through me? Sure, that means that. Nobody will go out of this room but through that door, but they're not part of the building. If I said, everyone will leave out of this, door, this, this, this building by that door, and there's no other way to go through but that door, that doesn't make you part of the building. In the time of Jesus Christ, he was the truth and he was the light. And he was the way towards God. Whoever followed him, whoever obeyed him, whoever imitated him, whoever loved him would find God, but that doesn't make him God by that statement. No more, no more so than a teller that works at the bank that hands you the money is the owner of that bank. And maybe Jesus meant the counselor was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was Gabriel, so that wasn't the counselor. The Holy Spirit, the sacred spirit, was the one that visited all the prophets, that also visited Mary, that visited Hannah, that visited Moses and Abraham, that brought all the scriptures. That's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit did come to Jesus, but that wasn't Jesus. And Jesus Christ did speak on behalf of God, but that wasn't God. So the people got confused, but the Romans, they already had, the Gentiles already had a triple God. So when they read and accepted what Paul wrote, they took the triple God idea, the pagan idolatry that they were already following, and they took the name of Jesus Christ and put it with them, and they called Angel Gabriel the Spirit, and Jesus the Son, and Almighty God the Father, and there you have the Trinity. But I ask anybody that's in here, does anybody in here understand how God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, a person, a person, a person. So God is a person, Jesus is a person, the Holy Spirit is a person, a person, a person, a person, three persons, one, two, three. How does one, two, three people get to be one? Give me that mathematics. Also tell me, how do they sit? How do they judge? Do God sit on the right? God sit on the top. Do God speak first or Jesus speak first? Do God speak and Jesus contradict? Who speaks first? Who stops? Who sits? Who stands? Who was there first? It's confusing. The Catholic Encyclopedia says concerning the Trinity, it is an absolute mystery that has never been answered until now, and it remains a mystery. Those of you who are Catholics have the Father, have the Cardinals, have the Monsignors, has the Pope, has anyone ever cleared up the mystery of the Trinity? Nobody, absolutely nobody. Because it remains a mystery. And another name for mystery is confusing. It's simply not true. No one spoke of a Trinity before 354 years after Jesus Christ. That was the first time the Trinity came about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That whole notion, it happened 354 years after Jesus Christ. So don't blame that on Jesus. Blame that on those that conspired 354 years after him. Now it's not your fault that you were born into a Catholic family, and I'm not gonna say it's your family's fault. We're human beings, and we're creatures of habit, and sometimes we just don't know how to stop the habit. But I'll provide you with some indelible information that will rock your socks. <laughs> Literally. If you want it now. And understand this, I have no aspersions. I cast no aspersions. I don't disrespect the Catholic Church. I don't disrespect Christians at all. Everybody is given to follow what they want to. But if you want to uncover some rocks and see what's underneath it, I'll do it for you. After all, I don't have a problem because I've been there. I'll give you a little personal story. I'm not an orphan. But my mother had nine children. And unfortunately, she was born poor in Harlem. So when I was two and a half years old, I wound up in a foster home. 
And between two years old, two and a half years old, until 16 years old, I was in six different foster homes. And every one of them was a different denomination. Protestant, Baptist, Episcopalian, Methodist, Methodist, and Catholic, and Pentecostal. So you know, I was all mixed up. <laughs> but by the grace of God, one thing that was clear, God was in my life. See, God was in my life. Different denominations, but God was in my life. So, by the grace of God, by the time I was 16 years old, I had kind of like tasted the whole buffet. So when I began investigating, I think I did a little bit of backtracking, a little bit of investigation. And that's why I can conclusively say to you that it's not necessarily the Christian's fault. It's your fault when you leave here. If you want to continue to plod ahead blindly and you want to ignore all the signposts, all the indications, all the propositions, all the indications that I've given to you, if you want to ignore that, you can. Or, if you're a Christian and you're sincere, I'll provide you with some more indications if you want to sit with me upstairs in that upper room. Uh, there is no um, criticism of Islam, I think this, what is this? Yeah, uh, since Islam is not governments, but why is the less freedom of religion so-called Muslim nations than in other nations? Okay, I think what the person here is saying that this is no uh, criticism of Islam itself, since Islam is not governments, you're right. But why is there less freedom of religion in so-called Muslim? Well, see, look, I'm glad you said so-called Muslim. Because everything rises and falls in human beings. And yes, it is true. It is pr true that in many of the nations where Muslims are, there, there is less human rights, open speech, open government. But there's a reason for that. If you study history, you find out that after Muslim lands were invaded, the invaders set up their own puppet governments. Then they created social conditions that became unbearable to force those Muslims out of their countries, and then they created institutions in their countries to invite those Muslims. And so the Muslims came into the Western countries to benefit from the institutions and to run away from the tyrants that were created by those who invaded their countries. Now, you got to really follow the history to understand it now. So because there seems to be what you call or what is called democracy or hypocrisy, whatever you want to call it, because there appears to be freedom of this and freedom of that, I want you to examine something else. What countries have the highest rate of prostitution in the world? The Muslim countries or the Western countries? What countries have the highest rate of drug addiction, alcohol addiction, and deaths that result from the two? The Muslim countries or the Western countries? What countries have the highest rate of suicide? The Muslim countries or the Western countries? What countries have the highest level of child molestation? and pedophilia, the Muslim countries or the Western countries? What countries allow pornography to be blatantly put on television, billboards, subways, magazines, in the public blatantly? Muslim countries, Western countries. So I ask you, which one of those countries would you consider to be more civilized? 
you have to answer that question for yourself. I've answered it. I've been to 37 countries. Now, of course, I thank God for the privilege of being an American, a Muslim American, because I have the best of two worlds. But Muslim American, not American Muslim. Because by being Muslim, I'm able to avoid most of the mines in the field of America. By being Muslim, I can avoid most of the corruption and the frustration and the disparagement and the immorality and the hypocrisy and the people whose lives are empty. This is by the grace of Almighty God. So I want to say to the person who asked that very nice question that the issue of freedom, don't mistake the issue of oppression by Muslim leaders to be a lack of freedom in terms of the people's spiritual ambition. Still, in the Muslim world, the Adhan is called five times a day, even in the oppressor countries. Still, the people are regulated by the Quran. Still, you find that women in the Muslim countries, they're not wearing the veil and not, they're not covering themselves and they're not honoring family and they're not honoring the, the vow of marriage. They're not doing this because they're forced to do so. I'll give you another statistic. Did you know that in the Western countries, between the UK and America, I won't count Australia, just the UK and America, did you know that 516,000 abortions are done every year? 516,000 children's lives are stamped out because people feel they made a mistake. And it's been approved by the government. That doesn't happen in a Muslim country. Family, family, the word family is still a treasured word in the Muslim countries. Family has become a very abstract terminology in the West. And even male and female has become abstract in the West. Did you know that in the Western countries, uh, two women can get married and adopt children? And did you know that in the Western countries, two men can get married and, ha and adopt children? That doesn't happen in Islam. Now, we won't go into the whole issue, the morality of whether somebody was born with that disposition and whether they got the individual right, so forth and so on, but animals don't do that. <laughs> the question, the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer was teaching, was teaching, not his own prayer. That was the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer was, the people asked Jesus Christ, teach us how to pray. In case the person who's writing here, you don't know. They asked Jesus Christ, oh Rabbi, teach us how to pray. And he taught them how to pray. That's called the Lord's Prayer. Now I'm not an authority on the Bible, but this is your scripture. That's what Jesus was talking this, not somebody else talking that, Jesus. And as for Paul did not write Revelation, I didn't say he did. The books that Paul wrote are very clear. Nobody knows who wrote Revelation because John is not known himself. John who? And there are different conflicting information as to who is this John. Is it the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or is it a John of Revelation? Or is it the John who was a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, I tell you, do your homework and you'll find out that the Bible authorities, the church itself, will tell you that the John of the four Gospels wrote 40 years after Jesus Christ that was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's not what I said. That's what the Bible authorities said. But I'll be available, again, in that upper room if you want to talk. A confused Christian. There appears to be difference in interpretation of Islam in many countries. Why is this? There's a, there's a confusion about Muslim, among Muslims about many things. Because some Muslims are knowledgeable, some Muslims are regulated, some Muslims are honest, some Muslims are decent, 
Some Muslims are God-fearing and some Muslims are confused, like some Christians are confused. So Muslims are just human beings. But there's no difference among Muslims about the Quran. No Muslims in the world. All Muslims know the Quran. If I arbitrarily pick this Muslim who I never met before I came to Australia, and I picked another Muslim who I never met from Indonesia, and I picked another Muslim who was from Arabia, and another Muslim from Africa, and another Muslim from Germany, and asked all of them to stand up, and I said, let us all recite from Surah Ammayat Asa'alun. I'll guarantee you, all of us would begin reciting until the end of that particular surah exactly the same, and we didn't know each other. But the Christians couldn't stand up and do that arbitrarily. You want to make that test? We can make the test. Any book of the Bible, you could not stand up and recite it all together using the same words and end up the same. Because there's 354 different versions of the Bible. And all the different denominations themselves don't agree the amount of verses or the amount of chapters or where they came from. Why is there not a united gathering of leaders to address the above? Unity is up to God. God puts inspiration in the hearts of people. It's not people who make that determination. I want to know that if God had the power to keep the Quran in its original form, why wasn't God able to save the, the other holy scriptures? It wasn't intended. And I'm not God, so that's not a question for me. The, pro the point is, is that God sent a messenger and God sent a revelation and God sent a legislation that was to clarify and to be the finality of all the prophets, all the revelations, and all the laws and legal edits that were sent. So if you follow the Quran, you're following all the rev previous revelations. If you follow Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, you're following all the prophets. And if you follow Islam, you're following the deen of the system of life that's been ordered by God to all the prophets. Why is there a need to preserve it in the beginning if it was only to a group of people when he sent it in the end for the entire world? You know, you can, you can keep ducking and dodging. You can still keep trying to find some kind of fault. You can still... Keep trying to find and see if you can find some reason. But the Quran is clear. It needs no defense. The life of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, is profound, like the sun in the sky. It needs no defense. Islam as a system of life needs no defense. I only say to you, stop asking all these questions and simply take the test, like they say. Take the Pepsi challenge. Read the Quran with an open heart. Read about the life of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, with an open heart and an open mind. Then after that, examine the system of Islam with an open heart. Whether you're a lawyer, a doctor, an architect, whether you're poor, you're rich, you're whatever it is, I guarantee you, your life will never be the same. Why do you cover your heads? Well, I don't know. I started losing all my hair, so I said, so. No. No, uh, Muslims, Muslims cover their heads, Muslim men cover their heads out of tradition and out of respect. Not all Muslim men cover their heads, obviously, but those that do, they do so because at times, the Prophet, peace and blessed be upon him, he liked to do that. Uh, for me, I like to distinguish myself as a Muslim. And whether I'm wearing a suit and tie, which I do sometimes, or whether I'm wearing a gown like I'm wearing today, I like to cover my head because not many people cover their heads. Not many Muslims, not many men, period, cover their heads with a brimless cap. So if I'm in an airport, I'm always designated. You know what that means, right? I always ask the people, I always ask the people in the lounge when they say, Mr. Yassin, um, you've been randomly selected. 
I said, I know, I'm designated, right? <laughs> and I turn around to the other people in the lounge and I say to them, is there something distinct about me that I should always be designated? <laughs> and what do you think they do? They say, yes. <laughs> so, yes, Muslims, many Muslims choose to cover their heads, just like most Muslim men following the tradition of the Prophet them, choose to grow a beard. So wearing of the beard and the covering of the head together, that kind of is like a, that's an indication that a person is a Muslim. Usually now, because it could be a Buddhist, could be a Hindu, could be a Sikh, it could be a Jewish person, but it's a different, usually a different kind of hat. So wearing of the beard is a tradition. Doesn't mean that a person cuts their beard off, they're not a Muslim, but most Muslim men, because it's the tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that he told us to do, they usually grow a beard. And some of us, we like to cover our heads. Now for the Muslim ladies, that's different. The covering of their head, and the wearing of loose garment, and the covering of their bodies, and the not showing of their attractions is a part of their uniform. God has given the Muslim ladies a specific uniform. So they would be distinguished and known as Muslim ladies. And they would not be molested. And that in the streets, when men see them, just by their, the way they're dressed, they would get some kind of respect. You don't hardly hear men whistling at Muslim ladies. <laughs> so, I mean, and don't think that the Muslim ladies are any less beautiful than any other woman. It's just that they hold and cover their beauty for their husbands. It's like pearls and diamonds. If I came to your house and I asked you, can I see your diamonds? Can I see your money? Can I see your jewels? Can I have your pin number? You wouldn't give it to me. And you wouldn't have it in front of me. Well, our women, our wives and our mothers and our daughters, they're worth more to us, they're more precious to us than our diamonds, our gold, and our pin number. Uh, is the translation of English sufficiently accurate? Um, actually, no language can adequately translate the Qur'an. The Qur'an is only in Arabic. It is only in Arabic. It's the formula of the revelation itself. However, the meanings of the Qur'an can be rendered into various languages. So that's all it is, a rendering. It is not a translation. Okay, I think that, is there more questions? I'll answer two or three more, is that okay? Maybe uh, he meant by the Comforter to be the Holy Spirit. Maybe the Spirit, maybe Jesus spoke as if Jesus also said that I am the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus didn't speak Greek. <laughs> now Jesus didn't speak Greek now. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Now what is Alpha and Omega in Aramaic? Alpha and Omega is part of the Greek language, isn't it? Isn't it? Jesus didn't speak that. This is something that somebody asserted to Jesus Christ. And this is the whole problem. You have people continuing to tagging stuff on Jesus Christ, saying something about Jesus Christ, lying on Jesus Christ, fabricating on Jesus Christ, blaspheming God, attributing things to Jesus Christ with no evidence and no proof except their own desires. Jesus didn't say this. And you're, you're reaching for straws, but you're out in the middle of the ocean. How do you explain evolution? Darwin didn't explain it well. <laughs> now here's a man, Darwin, Charles Darwin. Let's look into his life for a moment. Charles Darwin said that man evolved from monkeys. Did he say that? Okay, let's look at this here. I mean, he's gone, but let's you and I look at it now in the light of scientific exploration and fact. 
Do monkeys cry? Do monkeys cry? No, they don't. Monkeys do not have the intellectual capacity or emotion that they cry. Human beings do. That's just, much, that's just as much a part of their being as is their physical being. Yes, monkeys are mammals and human beings are mammals. But do monkeys calculate? Do monkeys orchestrate? Do monkeys investigate? Do monkeys earn PhDs? Do monkeys put up buildings? Do monkeys build zoos and put human beings in them? <laughs> Finally, if man was evolved from a monkey, wouldn't he still be evolving? What have we evolved to? And if man has evolved, if monkeys have evolved into men, why are monkeys still here? Darwin's theory lived about 25 or 30 years after he died. No one still puts forward the idea of Darwin's theory of evolution. That idea is dead just like communism is dead when the Soviet Union was dismantled. And if you are still talking about evolution, then you're really a bush doctor looking for a cure for, for polio. It's over with, it's finished. And that is not even the issue. It's, that is not even the issue. The issue is if Darwin feels that the theory of evolution is what we call natural selection, then we might can alter that because God was the one that made the natural selection for us to be here. But Darwin didn't say that. The other thing is that don't put too much stock on Darwin now because you've got to look at his personal life. He was a bit confused himself. Now, I don't like to talk about the dead, but Darwin has some major problems in his personal life. <laughs> Darwin has some major <laughs> moral inconsistencies that when you look at these major moral inconsistencies along with a theory that he put or he disguised or he hoodwinked the whole world with, I think it's time to put that to, we need to put that to rest where Darwin is. Why do you say that Islam is 1,500 years old when Adam is the first human as a Muslim? I didn't say that Islam was 1,500 years old. I said that the Quran was revealed 1,424 years ago. And I said that Adam and all the prophets were Muslims. It meant that Islam, meaning peace and surrender, was the faith of all the prophets, but it wasn't named until the Quran was revealed. <laughs> That verse came in the Quran, and that's when it became formally named as a system. Before that, it wasn't named as a system. If I didn't say that, I'm clarifying that now. What does Islam say about donating organs and about cloning? Uh, we Muslims, we do not donate organs. The organs that God gave to me are for me. However, some scholars said some scholars said that if my son or my daughter was dying of some rare disease and I have two kidneys or I have two of this or whatever the case might be and I wanted to donate that to them like giving them blood, this will become permissible. But I'm not allowed to take my body, which is a sacrament, my body, which is sacred, 
my body that was given to me by God, a body that was given to me as a gift that I don't own myself, I'm not allowed to take my organs and give them to other people and to create a new industry of spare parts. <laughs> and as for cloning, they will clone what God allows them to clone, but I'll guarantee you this. God says in the Quran, وَخَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَكْوِيمِ That we created man from the best of moles. Nobody will create what God has created. I'll guarantee you, if they've got a nation of clones somewhere, you've got a nation of freaks. <laughs> They're going to be deformed. They're going to be dysfunctional. There's going to be shortcomings, mix-ups, problems, complications, and there already are signs of that right now because they've got factories right now where they're doing, what is it called? Uh, robotronics. Robotronics. They are now experimenting by putting different kinds of parts inside of human beings, taking computer parts, and putting them inside human beings, making them half machine and half human. And they got experiments where they got buildings out in Texas, buildings up in France, and places where they are experimenting on human beings like that. But they've already got problems and complications with that right now because man is not able to create like God. Second thing is, if they want to clone something, that's no big deal because they're making something out of something, isn't it? If they really want to do something, let them make something out of nothing. You say that Islam is a complete system, but we're in this world nowadays where Islam runs completely in its entirety. I said that Islam as a system is complete. I didn't say that the human beings have followed it comprehensively. You see, if I bake a cake, even though I'm a Muslim and a baker, if I bake a cake and don't put the yeast in it, do you think it's going to rise because I'm a Muslim? <laughs> so if the Muslims right now are not applying Islam, then they ain't got no yeast. And it's not going to work for them either. But if the Muslims apply what God set up as a system. God says in the Quran, Inna dina inda Islam. Verily, the system in front of God that's acceptable to God is Islam, submission to his will. If men serve God the way God has ordered them to serve him, you don't think that man will get what he's supposed to get? I mean, some of us now have automobiles that have, what are those systems they got in the automobiles now? What do they call them? Navigation systems. A navigation system that you can interchange with different software that'll tell you from a satellite where you are, talk to you all the way into your driveway. A navigation system created by human beings. And you don't think that God who created the heavens and earth and created human beings is able to navigate them? Yes, whoever follows God's navigation, whoever follows God's guidance, Whoever follows God's scripture, whoever follows God's messenger, will also find God's guidance in the system of life that he has created for human beings and who is best to guide the human beings other than the one that created them. That's the last question. Uh, those who would like to meet with me, the non-Muslims, uh, I will meet in a designated room that the brothers who sponsored this uh, have set aside. Uh, the last question, I'm sorry. Oh, personal questions and answers for reverts. After the lecture, doors beside the canteen on the right-hand side. Okay, someone will direct you towards that. Thank you very much. May Allah bless you.